again. Welcome. It's our community, and I'm Mary Davidson. We have a wonderful guest today, and his name is Doug Wargle. And Doug is an author. He has a very, very interesting book on the market. It's called Thin Blue Smoke. It's nice to be here. And I, um, I was just telling him that I read it and enjoyed it, and I think you will too. It's a novel about love, mm -hmm. about friendship, about community. It's also about race, faith, music, bourbon, and the finer points of barbecue. Exactly. Now, does that about take in life? Yeah, it does. That's all of life, all the best things in life. Yes. <laughs> I think so, too. But, you know, normally, and I, and I have to, to start with this thought, normally when I read a book and I'm going to mm -hmm. interview an author, I following that plot right. because the plot snakes along like the river and the characters plug in and yep. you know but that's not true with no, Thin not. Blue Smoke. Thin Blue Smoke in my opinion is a group of character studies mm -hmm. that are tied together by the many facets of life. Mm -hmm. Now will you comment on that? Well, that's true. It's, I mean, and that's an accurate description, and uh, and you're not the first to make that observation. Uh, a, um, a lot of the book reviews that have been written about the novel have observed the same thing: that it's not a very plot-intensive story, and that the characters um, uh, really drive the story, as opposed to um, you know a plot with a with a you know a steep plot arc, um, as you might expect in a mystery or you know, in a, in a romance um, uh, novel. Uh, I st I, I've always enjoyed um, Garrison Keillor's uh, Lake Wobegon monologues on, uh, on Prairie Home Companion. Uh, in those monologues, he has created this Where all the women are beautiful and the children are brilliant. That's exactly right, exactly right. <laughs> he has created this, this community of, of, uh, of, of characters that is very real to his listeners uh, and to me and uh, and I've always admired his ability to create characters that you can really love and care about and that was my objective in in writing the novel it was to create characters that my readers would really truly uh, care about and love and uh, and you know feel sorrow for and feel joy with okay. so but you know your character is a little bit different in that first of all the characters are the are the book? Yeah, <laughs> uh, they don't drive it; they are it. Yeah, right. But but the but the thing is, um, some of them are a little bit harder to love than others, and they come from um, the street, as yeah, it were. Very tough backgrounds, right? Some of them. Yeah. And you know, um, what's interesting is that I was um, probably halfway through the writing of the book when I realized that, um, given that. The book is not uh, does not have a very uh, steep or, or discernible uh, plot arc, story arc. Uh, this th the story did need something to, to drive it forward uh, with a bit more oomph, oomph. And a bit, <laughs> yeah, a bit more push, a bit more uh, <laughs> right. momentum. And uh, I decided, for my purposes, that the story needed a, a sympathetic antagonist. And there is a character in the book who's very hard to love, and yet. I try to create a, a whole enough character that the reader would understand how that character came to be the way he is. Uh, in all of his unlovableness, there is still something um, vulnerable about him, uh, and, and I think that uh, readers uh, will probably know somebody like him in their lives. Oh, but I think we all know somebody That's like right. more than one of those characters. Right. But I think the, the thread that we need to pull out of what you just said was vulnerability. Right. Because I think people, we're all vulnerable, mm -hmm. all of us. Yes. And um, the nice part about these characters is there are pieces of all of them that are pieces of us as well. Right. And, and I think it's interesting. Well, we need to be introduced to some of those people. Um, one of the, the um, points in the book right. is neglected children. Right. And you have two of them to look at. Mm -hmm. And one is A.B. and right. the other is the big kid, Sammy Merzetti. Mm -hmm. Now, these two are rather polar opposites. They don't start out that way, though. No. They start out in, in almost exactly the same circumstances. Exactly. Uh, uh, economically, uh, in terms of their family histories, their backstories. 
uh, even geographically. They, mm -hmm. uh, you know, they, they have an early encounter with one another, and then their lives take... Sammy teaches A.B. how to smoke. That's right. That's right. And, uh, and they play basketball a little bit together at a really run-down trailer park um, in, in Sugar Creek. <laughs> Um, here in the in the Kansas City metro mm -hmm. area, and they, and yet it's pretty much at that point where their lives diverge, and um, either one of their lives could have taken um, either path, you know, towards uh, despair and hopelessness, uh, uh, and even crime, or uh, in the case of A. B. into uh, into a kind of a loving adopted family, uh, and um, and really a, a very um, satisfying uh, life surrounded by people who really care deeply about Do you about think him. that there is something within certain individuals that refuse to be downtrodden? You know, um, I, do, I do think that. Um, mm -hmm. I think also um, both of these characters, um, well, A.B.'s character, uh, um, you know, he literally, almost literally stumbled upon Laverne. The, the, you know, Laverne Williams, who uh, is the owner of the barbecue uh, joint that's kind of the central uh, geographic focal point of the novel. And, uh, and you know, was it coincidence or was it divine intervention that, that uh, put him literally on a path to that restaurant where he, uh, lacking a family, uh, a loving family of his own, found himself pulled into uh, the Williams family and really made uh, a part of their uh, their intimate um, you know, family. Let's go back to these two boys again because I want to make clear that they have, for all intents and purposes, no no family, no exactly. parents. Their their mothers are totally de right. destroyed. I mean, it, it, the whole thing is is a, a disaster right. to tell the right. truth is. And Laverne um, just happens to be there, but A. B. having lost everything. He really has. His mother has right. kind of pushed him out the door and he's walking along and he's extremely dejected. And um, he, um, he sees this kid up on the ladder and his name is Raymond. Right. And, but his father is Laverne. And Laverne right. comes out and he looks at A.B., looks him up and he looks him down and he says, may I help you, son? And he's now this A.B. is white, you have to understand, right. and Laverne, the Williams family, are black. And this is an important point. Yeah, We're going to come back to that in a minute. And um, A.B. says, drops his cigarette butt on the sidewalk. He's, what, 13 years old? Yep. Drops his cigarette butt on the sidewalk, and he says, and this is a very telling sentence, he says, I need a new life. Yep. Now that's, that's heavy stuff. And Laverne says to him, I don't have one to give, but how about a job? The defining moment, right. how about a job? At that point... And that job turned out to be the new life. Yes, it did. And of course, no one, not Laverne and not A.B. and not Raymond knew that that's what they were giving A.B. and no. what A.B., the gift A.B. was receiving at that moment, but that's what it was. But he agreed without a second thought. And he said, when do I start? <laughs> well... With that, he was then absorbed into the Williams exactly. family, and he became part of that family. He took that job at, what, 13, 14, right. whatever he was, and he stayed there forever. He's still there. <laughs> He's still there. He mm -hmm. is still there. On the other hand, mm -hmm. now, and your characters seem to be paired. Well, I, I have to, <laughs> thank I you have to. for observing that, yes. Mm -hmm. And the, the pair with him is Sammy Mercetti. Mm -hmm. And Sammy Mercetti, literally goes from bad to worse right. and ends up right you know uh, he, he's uh, he's not as gentle uh, a spirit as uh, as a B but his circumstances though um, very much the same. very much the same mm -hmm. are are a bit more negative in that uh, um, he, he falls under the influence instead of a loving individual like Laverne he falls under the individual uh, influence of several uh, men who are violent and self-serving and, uh, and mean-spirited. And, uh, and at each point that something positive might happen in Sammy's life, 
uh, because of circumstances either out of his control or a bad decision that he himself makes, his, uh, his life take, takes an, another turn in the wrong direction. And Sammy ends up That's very right. badly, right. Very, very badly. On the other hand, the Williams family lose their son. That's right. And this boy, AB, mm -hmm. becomes the child that they lost. That's I right. mean, that, that all brings that cohesion mm -hmm. together that you're looking for. Right. And this is really kind of interesting. I love this sentence. Uh, AB is a pallbearer in Raymond's funeral. Raymond mm -hmm. is the son who passes away. We didn't have a suit, but Angela Williams buys him a new suit and a nice new suit. Yes and he becomes a pallbearer, and you refer to him as a scrawny white birch in a grove of black oaks. <laughs> That's right. Raymond uh, is a uh, freshman at uh, Prairie View A&M in, in, um, in Texas, and uh, a traditionally black uh, university, where he's gotten a b basketball scholarship, and uh, he dies of a congenital heart defect uh, on the basketball court. And it's the rest of his uh, teammates who are uh, the other pallbearers, in addition to A. B. Mm -hmm. who is literally a very, you know, small, scrawny white kid. And in the grove of black oaks. Exactly right. I loved it. I do. I also loved Laverne's the description you gave of Laverne's office. You know, <laughs> the the barbecue place, smoked meat. It's not smoked meat. It's smoked meat barbecue, <laughs> and um, everything is kind of, you know always moving around, very, very, um, a lot of static electricity right. in the barbecue. But you talk about his office as, uh, Laverne's office, as the one place where things are left just the way they are. Right. And I think we all have a place like that, <laughs> where things need to be left just if the way If we don't have one, we should have We, we should, should have each one. have one, yes. We should have one. Okay, that's one pair. And, and, and you have to understand, this is a black-white pair again. Yes. And here comes another one, Delbert Douglas Mercer III and Frederick William Hartholz. Mm -hmm. Now, one of them is a butcher, and the other, um, Delbert is, is the, the African-American, and Fred is the butcher, the mm -hmm. white butcher. And they become partners. Yep. Like a Talk partners about um, that. in the, uh, now Delbert is Laverne's uncle, so. Yes, yes. Uh, so a lot of, uh, Delbert's story uh, takes place um, in the uh, 40s and 50s, yes. uh, in the Jim Crow era, yes. uh, and they're in deep Texas um, where, um, you know, discrimination and racism and segregation are a way of life. And uh, they live in Plum Grove, Texas, Plum which Grove, tiny Texas. little, uh, tiny little community um, north of Houston. And uh, it would not be seeming uh, in, or even allowed for uh, a black and white uh, man to partner up in a business. So, Delbert is the silent partner. Yeah, but you gotta. But but we have to be clear. Delbert put money in this. Oh business. yeah, he invested. He invested. invested heavily in the business. Yes, he did. And uh, and he and Hart Holtz. You know, it appears to the white uh, uh, community that Hart's uh, that that Delbert is uh, is is Hart Holtz's employee, but really they're business partners and they. They have a butcher shop, and uh, they sell uh, barbecue brisket out of the out of the back of their butcher shop, and that's where uh, Laverne learns a lot about well, the and, fine and, art of, of, and of barbecue. And Delbert and Fred are another good part of Laverne's life oh, exactly. because um, Fred um, or, um, Delbert is Laverne's uncle, yes. and he becomes sort of his guide. And his, he, very much his father figure, yes. Yes, and Laverne was going to be a ball player, right. and he hurt his shoulder, couldn't do it. And he said, why did God let this happen to me? Right. Why? And Delbert says, because, son, God's a lot like me. He doesn't give a, if you play baseball, and he's got more interested in who you are and not so much in what you do. I don't really care if you play baseball or not, Vern, except that I know you care. Mm -hmm. See, I, I and you, he says, you're still who you are, and it's times like these that can make you better, or they can ruin you. It's up to you. Mm -hmm. Lesson to be learned. Yes. Yeah. And, I th and we all need to learn those lessons, and there are, there are uh, we each come to times and moments in our lives where um, we're confronted with 
with that question of why did this happen to me? Well, and, and Delbert says you shouldn't always be asking why. There are mysteries in life, mm -hmm. which I, what I, I think that's, that's sort of interesting. Lessons kind of run through mm -hmm. the book. Um, the other pair that are not exactly paired, but they are in some ways. The top comes down and the bottom floats up. <laughs> A.B. and Ferguson. Right. And Ferguson, um, kind of an interesting guy, very well educated, comes from a very wealthy family, right. has had every opportunity, right. and he... Squanders it. Squanders it, exactly. Why? Why do people do that? I don't know. Yeah, nobody when knows. Nobody knows. No. Right. And um, I'd like to read. He says, he, oh, by the way, he was an Episcopal priest. Right. And it says, virtually every journalist was writing about the young priest, Ferguson, and his sudden success felt compelled to make note of his physical resemblance to the popular depictions of Christ. Um, shoulder length, brown hair, beard, high cheekbones. Ferguson's usual response to this was to say that he disappointed by the comparison because he'd actually been uh, aiming for more of the John Lennon look. <laughs> but he had every opportunity. Right. He had a and published this, and, book. And the, the time period that that, that paragraph was written about was the uh, was the early 60s during the civil rights movement. Yeah. Whereas most had, of the story And he had place. a book, right. a bestseller. Exactly. And he fell prey to alcohol. Alcohol. Right. And, um, and self-doubt self and insecurity doubt. and a distant father. And it right. caught up with him. Right. He was not strong enough to overcome his trials, right. if you will. Um, religion runs all through this book. It does. I mean, it kind of slops over the edge, all mm -hmm. over. Um, is it a salvation, a hope for redemption? What is it? Well, I mean, uh, uh, we all, whether we acknowledge it or not, we are all in need of redemption. And, um, and uh, it, some of us don't understand that. Some of us do. Uh, some of us feel that we achieve it. Some of us feel that it's, uh, that it's escaped us. Uh, but I do think that, um, you know, whether people uh, believe in uh, that, that God uh, reaches out and redeems us or not, uh, we all, I think, come to a point, many points in our lives, where we uh, feel as if we need a second chance. We feel as if we bottomed out. We feel as if we, um, uh, you know, we need to be lifted up. And um, it's what we do and how we respond in exactly those situations that I think charts the course of our life and also makes us who we are um, for better or for worse. Ferguson comes very close to redeeming himself at the end of the prayer meeting. Um, and, and that we're talking about the Martin Luther King era now. Right. And he goes with a female. Right. And talk about that scene, because he comes close. Well, um, you know, he, uh, he, he, he goes to um, the uh, rally at the uh, Masonic Temple in Memphis the night before Martin Luther King Jr. is assassinated. And he goes with uh, a young woman about his age uh, that he's met at a barbecue joint. And she happens in to be African American. And she's and African American, he and he's white. Yeah. Um, and uh, she doesn't know, of course, anything about his fame as an author or his, uh, you know, renown as a, a civil rights activist. Um, she just knows that he's a guy who came in and ordered barbecue and seems kind of lonely. Um, uh, but they, uh, you know, they go to that, uh, that rally. Um, the next day he leaves, returns to his home in New York and learns uh, of the tragedy. And, um, and yet that's not the last time that, that, that he and this character no. uh, encounter one another. But um, her daughter is blinded. Right. And at the same time, in Plum Grove, Texas, Laverne is listening to the radio right. and he hears that Martin Luther King has been shot and he says this changes everything this changes everything mm -hmm. do you believe that yeah I do believe that it changed everything um, uh, both well <laughs> um, in a very uh, sad and ironic way it it changed things for the better in that uh, his assassination I think um, uh, was very much um, a sacrifice for the sins of, of the nation 
and uh, and it galvanized um, uh, the powers that be in this country to act, whereas they might have been um, stuck in their complacency um, and, uh, and passivity and allowed uh, things to just unfold at a much slower pace. And I think his sacrifice really did move things forward in the direction that they needed to move. And it did change everything. Mm, it changed but, everything. but before we jump into the abyss <laughs> of, of permanent um, um, disappointment with mankind, we have <laughs> A.B.'s conversion. And it brings us back up, and he says, uh, he's about to get robbed. Right. And um, he says, now the guy's Billy standing there with a gun, and he says, next thing I know, I see this flash of light, it blinds me. And everything is all dark around me, but I see this light in front of me, and I hear a voice, <laughs> a strong but kind of quiet voice, and it says, you're all right, you're safe, keep your eye on me. <laughs> And, I, and he says, and I do feel safe. I don't feel afraid of Billy and his knife. His voice is telling me, stay with me, A.B., stay with me. You're mine and I need you. I need you is the operative right. phrase here. We all want to be needed. Exactly. But you keep pulling us back. Right, right. So we are, we're, not, um, we're not just um, wallowing in the depths of despair. And I certainly wanna, wouldn't want to give anybody the impression that this book is, is all darkness and despair because... No, it isn't. No. No, it isn't. And um, Ferguson is brought in there at the end and he said, oh, he said, A.B. says, looked at Ferguson, he says, nobody ever believes me because nobody believed he really saw the right. light and uh, was all this kind of business. And Ferguson, he didn't smile much, but he did smile at A.B. and he said, I envy you, young man. And he says, why would you envy me? Because he says, but I do believe you. That's why. And that's why. I mm -hmm. do believe you. Somebody right. believed him. Right. And, and I think um, it's just, I don't know, you keep, you keep it's like a ping pong ball. You mm -hmm. keep pushing it back and forth. Um, a lot of this is about um, wrestling with the angels. <laughs> exactly. Because they do. Talk about that. So. Well, you know, um, one of the things that has um, uh, tormented Ferguson, here he is, an Episcopal priest. He's devoted his life to, um, to God and yet feels very distant from God, feels that God has been largely silent and absent in his life, um, which is kind of a reflection of his relationship with his father, uh, who is also an Episcopal priest, but, a, you know, but, but not the warmest of individuals. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and Ferguson has wanted and longed for and ached for a, an encounter with God uh, and has never experienced that. And that's one of the things that he envies about A.B. in this moment, whether A.B. actually encountered, um, you know, eternity in that moment, uh, you know, after he'd been clubbed on the head, um, is really left to the reader to decide because there's other ways to interpret that that particular moment in A.B.'s life, and, and that's intentional on my part, is creating a degree of ambivalence about what exactly happened to A.B. at that moment. But Ferguson is willing to believe that, that you know, that A.B. encountered an angel as he, as A.B. describes it, um, and is deeply envious uh, that uh, A.B. might have encountered something of the eternal and something of the divine because he himself, Ferguson, has felt this his entire life. This Episcopal priest. That's right. This that's Episcopal right. priest has felt yeah, uh, yeah, this right. deep spiritual void yeah. and the, he has felt more the absence of God than the presence of God in his life. And we do wrestle with the angels. Exactly right. In whatever way we wish to call it, that's but right. we certainly do. I, I do think there's another, another thread that I want to pull out mm -hmm. of the book and that is choosing the road to follow. And I think mm -hmm. that's a big part of your book. And when um, Delbert is talking to Laverne about his uh, mother, and he says... Laverne's mother. Oh, Laverne's mother, mm -hmm. yes. Uh -huh. And uh, he was out smoking briskets, and he said, she did choose the wrong one, but she chose it. Mm -hmm. He made, it, it's in italics in the book, right. she chose it. She didn't wander down it accidentally. She chose the wrong road because it was the wrong road. Right. Do you believe that? Yeah, that happens. You know, I mean, I think that uh, there are some people who 
um, become spiteful. I'm not sure that, that I believe that people are born, born spiteful, but there are people who become spiteful and, um, and make you know, bad decisions because they're bad decisions and, um, and choose the wrong path because it's the wrong path. And, uh, and Laverne's mother was one of those. And, um, you know, thankfully for him, and he had a, a loving grandfather, or a loving grandmother, and, a, and, a, um, and, a, and an uncle uh, who, um, who gave him lots of, of love and guidance. And guidance. That's right. Guidance. And in return, Vern gave it to A.B. Laverne gave it to A.B. Exactly right. So I, I think that, um, do you think religion is the agent here? You know, um, I think that, uh, that love is the agent. And, um, and you know, um, uh, I think that, that, you know, obviously, uh, you know, it, um, the relationship of these characters to one another and their relationship to God is, uh, is an important theme throughout the novel. Um, uh, and again, I leave it to the reader to decide um, in which instance God is at work in their lives or in which instance uh, they uh, have excluded God from their lives or, or don't acknowledge God's presence. Well, you know, Ferguson says we're in a thin place, right. in a thin place. And I think that's true. Right. In, in so, well, I think we're all in a thin place. Mm -hmm. And... Um, you, you make the point that everybody deserves another chance. Sometimes second chances don't take, though. Yeah, sometimes second chances don't out. take, uh, and you need a third, and you need a fourth. That's certainly been true in my life. Um, in fact, I don't know anybody. Yeah, but you have four daughters. <laughs> that's, right. that's right. And each one of them represents a second chance. Yeah, um, that's right. Um, you know, the, I think that, um, that that's, a, that's, a, that's unique to the human condition, is that we all need... Um, you know, a second chance in yeah. life, and and most of us need several second chances. Well, and you say second chances are grace, and third chances are grace upon grace, and beyond that, it's all mercy. Right, it's true. <laughs> and mercy is what we mm -hmm. need. Where are you going to go from here? You writing again? I'm writing again. I'm writing a second novel. Um, it's taking longer um, than uh, than the first one did, uh, and you know sometimes I worry that maybe um, you're you drying know, up. <laughs> <laughs> that maybe I only had the one in me, you yeah. know. Um, and if that's the case, then I'm I'm still grateful that uh, that yeah. you know that I had the opportunity to write it and that it was published and people see, are reading it. I, I believe that with the firm belief that you have, um, because this book is just infused with the themes of love and forgiveness mm -hmm. and faith and doubt and giving and receiving, prejudice, tribulation, this whole black white pairs. Mm -hmm. You know, there are always opposites in right. some way. A sense of community, and that's important. And somehow it, it touches a person's inner godliness, whatever you want to call it, whatever that might mean and wherever mm -hmm. it may lay. I think that as I thank you very, very much, mm -hmm. Doug Wardle, for being with us, I want to talk about the congregation and what they sang at Laverne Baptism in the Trinity <laughs> River. And they said, when peace is like a river attendeth my way, when sorrows like sea billows roll, whatever my lot thou hast taught me to say, it is well, it is well with my soul. It is well with my soul, it is well with my soul, it is well, it is well with my soul. Amen. Read it, it's really good. <laughs> Thin blue smoke, thanks Doug. Thank you Mary. It was wonderful. It was delightful to be here. It's our community. Thanks for being with us.